Now, I, I, I'm going to focus on two areas, and as I said, I, I want to keep it very focused on those one or two questions that have come in. But I do want, given that we're a small group, uh, people can ask any question they like at any time, and then we can just carry on with all these later. But I want to focus on two areas, because I, I believe in order to be able to manage obesity well, you need to be able to understand uh, obesity, the person, and then I, I want to go through a spectrum of treatment and I'm, I'm happy to go in as much depth as you want in any particular area that you want as well. So just holler out, et cetera. Uh, I mean, we brought up the issue of obesity in terms of most people here. Actually, before I go on, can I ask uh, people in the audience, who's sort of more interested in um, adults? Who looks after adults? Who looks after um, adults? Adults. So it's, yeah, so it's about two thirds adults and about a third, I, I would say, pediatric. And in terms of, um, we'll focus on, people know about the definition of obesity in terms of using BMI for adults, uh, a lot easier than uh, the pediatricians who have to adjust it depending on age, etc. So it's a lot easier for us. Then the comp- have to be simpler for adult <laughs> I'll accept that. So, sorry, did someone? Yeah, I didn't catch all the uh, weights. Could you just go back to that? Thing? In terms of the classification, so, yes. So there's a pre-obese. Well, that's that's really the other word for saying overweight. But this was WHO uh, a while back, and and really, if you in the literature, one thing that I've noticed in recent years, we used to say that people with a body mass index of over forty had severe obesity, but the term clinically severe obesity is coming to the literature a lot more now. And that usually tends to be with people with a BMI of over 35 who have a comorbidity. And you have to remember, these are for, this is for a Caucasian population. If you look at Asians and or Polynesians, it's different, but I, I won't harp too much on that. Um, these are the complications that Louise has talked about a lot of them. And, and essentially, as I say to a lot of the junior doctors, it affects every organ system in the body, if you think about it, some more than others. And in every discipline, even though I'm an endocrinologist, I can turn, and, and although 99% of what I do is obesity related, I think I'm more of a general physician these days. Not just if you develop a comorbidity, probably more importantly is at what stage is that comorbidity? In other words, um, and you can broadly group them in terms of medical comorbidities, functional and mental. And what I mean by that is um, medical. People usually think about uh, obesity with diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and, and they talk about people being metabolically healthy. Uh, and then you've got the functional or mechanical uh, issues of obesity in terms of arthritis, sleep apnea, uh, and then you've got the, the psychological aspects of it as well. And the real issue is, let's say you have diabetes. Someone might um, be, as they talk about, pre-diabetic, or you may get to the stage where people have significant end organ damage from it. So it's not just whether someone has uh, a large amount of excess weight, but also what effect has it had on them? And I think sometimes it's probably more important to look at the effect, not just the weight. Now, I'll, I'll put it to you. I, I've got here, why do people develop obesity? I, I'm as interested in what you think as, I, as I'm sure you're interested in what I think. So why do, why do people develop obesity? They've got the money to buy the food, which is there for them to buy everywhere. All right, so we've got to vote for food. And when Louise was here in the beginning, I thought I was at a Sydney real estate auction market. We were talking about figures and, you know, so just a, so we've got a, a vote for food. Genes. In, uh, sorry? Genetics. How, how, John? What do, what do genes do, John? Your mum's fat, you might fat too. Yeah, but in what way? How does the genes make you big? Well, I don't know, maybe you've got the tendency, I do not know. But uh, you look like your dad, are you? <laughs> All right, any other takers? Lifestyle. What does lifestyle mean? Lack of exercise, and of course you do. Okay, sorry, lack of exercise, what you do. Because I, I, I will, most of the patients that I see come along and say, yeah, it's my lifestyle. And I say to them, yeah, what does that mean? I'm going to be like a kid who's going to keep asking why until I get the answer that I want. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think people have changed that much, but I think our environment has changed dramatically and it's an obesogenic environment. Everything we do pushes us towards being fat rather than being thin. Okay. 
So, but where do you think most of the money is in terms of the? I mean, a lot of the people that I see will come in, and and, and John will tell you. Oh. <laughs> no, that's fine. I'll double check. That's all right. We can we can keep talking. I they just um, people will say I say to them, okay, you're as big as you are, and the average person that I see um, is probably about 150 kilos with a BMI of over 55, and I say, well, what's the problem? You get the camp that says it's my lack of exercise. And the other camp that says, oh, maybe I have too much to eat. And food. food? Any exercise takers? Yes. I've found as a doctor over the years that my work has become much more sedentary. You know, I used to be much more on my feet, but, but my work now can stretch me to a room sitting watching a TV all day or a video. I have to go out and walk 10,000 steps, you know, to make up for it. And I'd like to ask you, do you think that this huge movement now of people not living in the quarter acre block anymore, but living in a small apartment, not getting out and not exercising, do you think that's contributing to it as well? All right, so it sounds like you're a vote for exercise. Well, yeah, and, and, the, other, and the rest. Well, what was it? If you had to put, where, where are you going to put your money? Oh, on, on diet. Sorry? I'm not going to eat, I think. Oh, okay. And sorry, there's a question behind you. We are all hunter-gatherers, and we have not yet evolved a lot beyond that. We are designed for starvation, not for excess food. We now walk into a shopping centre and have food all around us every time. So we're designed to exercise a lot, to run all day, and to eat very little, and to eat it intermittently, and to starve. And we never starve. Who has starved? In this room, has anybody ever starved? We designed to starve. What a surprise, we're now all obese. So why are we surprised? We need to return to our roots. We need to have periods of starvation or at least near starvation. We need to exercise a lot more. And of these, the food is obviously going to be the major component. Who cooks at home? Mm. Nobody cooks at home anymore. Does anybody eat beans anymore? We talk about, we, we've got money to spend on food. You can eat well very cheaply if we cook for ourselves, but nobody cooks for themselves. We have fast food. Our parents never went to restaurants. Fast food is the problem. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. There's a, all right. So there was some other, yes. I've done a case study of one over the last 12 months from a fairly active lifestyle, three days a week, well, three sessions a week at the gym, two days bushwalking, um, I maintain the same diet and that has, oh, and I've put on 10 kilos. So, and the only change I think is the activity, which has been due to a number of minor illnesses. 10 kilos one year. All right, let me ask some questions in a different way. All right, you're 100 kilograms. Um, you do a moderate activity, which means you get a bit breathless when you're doing that activity. How, how many calories or kilojoules per minute do you burn up? Hardly any. <laughs> now I'll be in my auction face. Okay, we've got hardly any. Any other takers? Come, throw us, give us a figure, guys. You just have to do that. Yeah. yeah, per minute. How many calories? Two. Yeah, two. It's actually a bit more than that. If you're 100 kilos, it's about seven or eight. Okay, so seven or eight um, that you burn up. If you can, and I mean, how many calories are in a cheeseburger? Oh, three, four hundred. About, yeah, about 350. Yeah. Um, how many calories can you consume in a minute? Lots. Yeah, a lot. Give me some figures. 150. Uh, Probably, okay, 150, any other? Liquid. Oh, yeah. Well, well, it could be liquid or anything. Well, yeah. It's probably about 70 or 80. So it's tenfold. Yeah, Have a, think about some of those figures and then I'll, as, we're, as we're going along. All right, so why do people... Okay, it's... Oh, it's delayed. <laughs> these days you're getting... These are called system maps where people talk about these are all the causes of obesity, etc. What I want to say to you is I don't want you to confuse the what, the how, and the why because I think everyone does and then it becomes all a bit of a blur. Let's, let's look at the what. This is what we essentially we were saying before. We were saying that at the end of the day, what causes severe obesity is an energy imbalance over a longer period of time. And what this says here is that essentially 
if I can measure what your output is and your weight is stable, then I know what your input is because no one has malabsorption, let's face it. The question is, and what this tells me is, do people know what a basal metabolism, basal metabolism is? That's basically the amount of energy that your body uses up if you're just sitting there, not eating, awake, etc. And as you can see from here, basal metabolism is about 70 to 80 percent. So most of our energy expended is not physical activities. And out of these physical activities, only about half of that would be uh, structured physical activity. The rest is incidental. And this is the only constant one, the one with thermogenesis. Okay. You might say, um, how, actually, before we go on to that, what are the energy requirements for a healthy weight in the adult, in an adult? And people can say either kilojoules or calories, whatever you're thinking. <coughs> Female about 2,000 calories a day. Okay. 2,000 calories? Any... For a female. Okay. I thought it was more like 1,200 calories. Or oh, maybe that's for weight loss. That's, called, that's defined as a low calorie diet. Oh. Yep. All right. So 2,000. Anyone so else? How about males? 2,500. For females or males? Males. 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 Okay. That's very good. Okay, so essentially this is what you're saying. I've just converted, if you want to think about kilojoules, you just multiply it by four. It's actually 4.2. But for a male, this is the average height of men. This is the average height of females. Uh, in 2014, there's a website. It's called 8700.com. And what that is, is it tells us that the average adult in Australia consumes 8,700 kilojoules per day. That's if our society was a healthy weight. We don't consume 8,700. We consume 10,000. This is what we should be consuming. So that's now, this is what I was saying before about stable weight, basal metabolic rate, etc. You, you might be some skeptics in the audience thinking, well, how can you be so sure? How do you know? All of our patients come in and say, but I have a, a great diet. I don't eat anywhere near as much as I eat. How can I be so confident that that's true? This is me about 15 or 20 years ago. <laughs> this, is, this, is a, this, is, this is how you measure someone's basal metabolic That's rate. A, it's accurate, isn't it? It is. It's not straight. I, 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 this, I, I got that very first machine. I, I, um, I, I did the validation of it. You didn't send me a bill, by the way. No, I know, I know. But the bottom, the bottom line is um, we, um, and this is Professor yeah, Wayne. Go back to that machine. Tell us what is it doing? Basically, the, the bottom line is that you, you, I'm, you're watching TV, you're breathing oxygen, you breathe out carbon dioxide, and because of the exchange, we know how much energy is used up in that exchange, you know how much energy you're using up. Um, in terms of, we actually looked at, so this was at Royal Prince Alfred um, many years ago when I was working there, and as you can see, there are over a 1,000 people who were measured. This was only a snapshot of it. There's been probably 5,000 or 10,000 people. And these are people who, as you can see here, men, 148 kilos, women, 123. So if you're going to find anyone with a slow metabolism, you will definitely find it in this audience. Now, these are the results. Remember what you said before? This is the basal metabolic rate. So the average man who had a weight of 148 kilos, their basal metabolic rate was 2,500. And the average basal metabolic rate for a female was 2,000. What that means is that's three quarters of the, that's three quarters of their energy intake. So in other words, these people who have severe obesity, they're consuming about for men 3,300 a day, and for the women it's about 2,700. Okay, and we didn't. Sure, there there might be some variation. It's about five percent. <laughs> But the bottom line is, we went and um, Brett basically put together a predictive equation, and these are the factors. It is true that as you get older, your metabolism does slow down, but only by a factor of two. As you get bigger, your metabolism goes up by a factor of 10. As you get taller, your metabolism goes up by a factor of four. Men have a higher metabolism than women. And interestingly enough, people with diabetes also had a higher metabolism. <coughs> Sorry? A higher metabolism than women. No, no, they're non-diabetic. So these are just the factors. So 
this is in a severely obese patient population. So when, when people come to the clinic, we, we basically can put all these numbers in. And the general concept is, if you have a large car and you turn it on and it idles, it chews up more petrol than a small car. This concept, but you'll have a lot of patients who come along and say, I must have a slow metabolism. In the 20 years that I've been looking after some of the largest people in the world, I've yet to find it. Yeah. I mean, that's, so that's what, um, you know, that's what happens. The question is, how do people consume extra energy? And, and it's not just, um, and there's all these, I, I just as not spell it out, please. But let, let's go into it with pictures, it's not easy. Portion sizes, as Louise mentioned. Now that should be a family portion size of lasagna, but in many cafes you go to, that's the portion you're given. I always talk to people about uh, imagining they're on an aeroplane. And, and you, people say, I don't have large portions. But then you say, when you're on an aeroplane and they serve you that portion, um, that's what it should be. You can see their eyes change and they think, ah, oh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's not a portion that I have. And, and, and the big thing that um, also is when we were talking about energy consumption, you know, the coffee, the coffee culture, they said, but I have skim milk and, and we have eight or six or whatever it is, skim ca ca cappuccinos or cafe lattes. And I say, think of those as coffee milkshakes. That's what they are. And, and as you said before, with solid food, you might be able to consume 70 or 80 calories per minute. But with liquids, you can double that. So when someone comes in and says, my problem is that I don't have breakfast or that I don't have lunch, I say to them, no, that's not your problem. Your problem is once you start eating, you don't stop. Because let's say our energy requirement is, um, as we said, 2,000 calories for women, 2,500 for men. How long would it take you to get to 2,000 calories for women if it's um, 70 calories per minute? 30 minutes. 30 minutes of solid eating and you've blown your budget. <laughs> That's all it is. And for men, it's a little bit longer. So when someone says it's not the fact that they don't have breakfast or lunch, it's the fact that they, and people with severe obesity eat a lot faster or drink a lot faster than the average person as well. All right. Any questions before I go on from that? Because I, I think it's really important to understand. Um, what right. am I going to tell my patients now? It must be your metabolism. <laughs> you can if you like, John. Now, in terms of people talking about abnormal foods or not the right kind of foods, if you say that someone's supposed to have about 2,000 calories um, a day, let's, you break up the meals, it's roughly about 700. Now, if people, when they had a meal, had this meal here, where they have half this cheeseburger or whatever it is, a few fries, some salad, that's fine. But no one does that. They do that. They don't have to. I know they don't have to, but that's but what I'm, what we're talking about now is what they do and how they do it. And I can tell you, most of the people that I see will actually tell you that it's not the junk food. They actually get more damage is done from the supermarket, the dollar loaf of bread, or the two dollar uh, two liter or four liter carton of milk, etc. It is all about energy. But now this is the this is the real question. This is the big question. And as John said before about genes, why, why do people consume extra energy? Yeah. They mustn't get the feedback because satiety just must not kick in okay. to say they're full because to eat at that rate. All right, but why, why are they have it in the first place? <laughs> Where do they start? Yeah, because, and, and to answer someone else's question before, one of the first questions I ask people is, um, can you tell me when you truly... Because people say, oh, I have what I have because I'm hungry. Some people say that. And I say to them, can you tell me the last time you truly felt hungry? And I can tell you that over 90% of my patients will scratch their heads. They can't remember. And as, as the speaker was saying, that we, we're designed to fast and starve in a way, etc. cetera. Um, any other takers? So it tastes nice. It's available. Um, it doesn't get back to what Dimitri said. You know, we, we're born basically to live in a famine. True, true. We're designed that there won't be the food around, so if it's there, we have it. Because we're yeah. in a family, we've got to eat it. Yeah, but let's say we, we've had, we have enough. Why should we have more? We should get used to it. Our, and our stop button isn't there. Well, I, I, just, to, just to let you know, one of the patients that John and I are involved with, 
and it'll probably be on Tuesday on Channel 10. Um, I had a very interesting conversation. This, this was a man that we organised bariatric surgery on, the largest case in Australia by about 100 kilograms heavier than anyone else. So we ended up doing the surgery on this gentleman who weighed 378 kilograms at the time. Now, I had a very interesting conversation with him the other day. He basically said um, a few things that he hasn't said to me in the past. And this is, a, I mean, he basically said, I never feel full. Never. So, but, but in my mind, again, I, I like to keep things really simple. There are two main reasons why people consume what they consume. One is because they like it. And two is because they've had some traumatic events in their life and it's their drug of choice. They don't get any pleasure out of what they're having. It's their drug of choice to sedate them. He, even, my patient, even used the word food coma. You know, <laughs> they eat themselves to sleep, etc. cetera. So um, I, like Louise, I'm lucky enough to go around the world and go to all these obesity conferences. This was one in Malaysia. This was the international. I don't know if you stayed at this hotel, Louise, but this was at breakfast. But basically, you'd have breakfast, um, You'd be on your table, you, you got up to get a second yeah. serving, you um, had to leave it like that to say, I'm still hungry, don't clear the table. It wasn't until you were full that you were able to swap it over and then they clear it. But the point I want to make there is, and this is what I say to my patients, if, you, if your stomach is empty, you are truly hungry, I believe you. If you put some food in your stomach and you wait half an hour, hunger goes away. If you keep going, then you have a sense of fullness. And if you keep going further, then you become overfull. Unfortunately, the signal from our stomach to our brain is very slow. And if I ask my patients and I say to them, tell me 15 minutes or 30 minutes after the largest meal you've had in the day, put a cross on somewhere along there, where are you? I can tell you that over 90% of the people I see will put a cross right down there. So... And people's notions that they have to keep eating, the word satiety or satisfaction was used, that they have to keep consuming until they feel full. Yeah, that, that's definitely not the starvation that we need to have. And most people that I see um, will keep eating until they're full and they can't remember when they were last hungry. This is just, you know, um, these are the two main areas that we said, palatability of food and also anaesthetise unwanted feelings. They're the two main categories, but there are broad areas around it. In terms of benefits of weight loss, um, the WHO, if you look at absolute benefits, you've got, if you lose 10 kilograms and maintain it, there are benefits to mortality. All of the comorbidities will have benefits from that. But I, I want to, just to, to make it simpler, think of these figures. You've got 5% weight loss, 10% weight loss, 15, and more than 20. If you have 5% weight loss, you do get an improvement in these metabolic or mechanical or other issues. 10%, um, you, you can reduce people's medications. They will also live longer if they maintain it. 15%, in many cases, you can actually stop a lot of the medications. Um, and 20%, you get remission. The reason I became very interested in what I do is when I was training to be an endocrinology advanced trainee back in about 1998, I was doing the diabetes clinic. I, I would see people with um, severe obesity and um, I basically worked out that if I could get them to lose weight, be fitter, they would outperform any medications I could prescribe. Nothing has changed in 2018. So 20 years later, nothing has changed. <laughs> Um, the other thing is, if you notice, I'm, I'm saying, and Louise probably picked it up, I'm saying people with obesity, mm. not, a, not obese people. That we both say that. Exactly yeah. the same and way. I think it's important because that's the other notion, as, as I've got here, if you lose more than 20%, a lot of these problems will go into remission. It's important to have the notion that patients understand that obesity, whether you believe it's a disease or not, personally, I... Happy to call it a disease because if we're calling things such as gastroesophageal reflux a disease, mm -hmm. dyslipidemia a disease, well, then it is a disease as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's not a huge issue in my mind. The important thing is that obesity can be treated. You can lose that excess weight and it can have all of these implications on all of the disorders that are secondary to it. 
This is the obesity management algorithm in Australia in 2016. I suppose I could just leave that up there, sit down, and you could read it. But, you know, let, 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 me, let me go through it. You have to give us 10 minutes. So you can talk to us instead. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I want you. Sorry. Sorry, John? Let me eat it. If you're feeling hungry. Yeah. All right. Now, in terms of, I, I call this the S's. If, if you look at any obesity management program, Program, you can summarize every component of it into S. In other words, um, you've got standard advice that you can give people. You can give specific advice to individuals one on one. There is the concept of supervision in terms of whether it be exercise, shopping, and also support. You can um, do things to help shrink meals, whether it be smaller plates, meal replacements, etc. Uh, don't worry too much, I will go into a lot of these things. There is the use of specialist medication. Um, for weight loss. And also you might want to swap from, from medications that you know promote weight gain to medications that are more weight neutral or weight losing. And there is um, surgery, not just bariatric surgery, but the consequences after where they need skin reduction surgery as well. Ooh. Ooh. Now, before you start, the, the, the S that's the most important is the safe one. This is, uh, jo jo this is a, a picture by John Holcroft, a, a UK illustrator who basically said, when people with severe obesity go out in public, this is how they feel, that everyone's throwing them daggers, and these are that they're lazy, they're gluttonous, etc. That's how they feel. So from the point of contact, and, and as Louise was talking about before, I was, one of my advanced trainees was saying that a lot of her friends in general practice will not write obesity on people's um, list of problems, whether it be children or adults, because they're scared that the patients will become upset because of the stigma and they won't come back. So it's a huge issue that we need to address. So the most important thing is we need to make people feel psychologically safe, but as well physically safe. The seats that you're sitting on are only probably weight rated to about 160, 180 kilograms. Most of the patients that I see, well, many I should say, are way over that. So we need to have seats that go up to 400 kilograms. We need to have examination couches that go up to 400 kilograms as well. So you need the psychological safe aspects and the physical safe aspects. And you need to understand, another is understanding what is success to the patient. When patients say to you that I tried this treatment and it didn't work, what does that mean? What that usually means is I wanted to lose 45% of my total weight but I only lost 5%, so therefore it didn't work, and so I stopped it. Yeah. Or they think of a diet or whatever it is, a bit like a course of antibiotics. You have it, and then it's treated, and then it goes away, etc. The reason I've got this excess weight loss here is because the surgeons always talk about excess weight mm -hmm. loss. But I, I want to give you an example of that, so to make it just so that, you know, um, just to show you that it's very biased towards those people who are not as large. Recently, I, I went on holidays with the kids. I, I put on four kilograms in a week because I went into an environment where they had some of the best food that I've had for a long time and just relaxed, etc. Now, that meant that when I got back, I was four kilograms overweight. Okay. Within a week, I lost three of those kilograms because I went back to what I was doing before. According to this classification, I lost 75% of my excess weight in a week. And that's what bariatric surgery, they always talk about 60%. So I did great. I didn't need my bariatric operation. Yeah. <laughs> I think the important thing is, yeah, I, I mean, when you were a, a 200 kilos, 300 kilos, there is some merit. But at the end of the day, it's about percentage. So as you can see here, patients who have severe obesity, if they've only lost 15% of their total weight loss, they're disappointed. And what, what in terms of treatments, Lifestyle intervention. What's the long-term weight loss you get with lifestyle intervention? Yeah. Any, any? Five percent. Five percent. Any other takers? Well, if it depends, uh, depends on how strict and how good it is. Oh, but just long-term and yeah. So, anyone else? Ooh. It's about five percent. It varies between about two percent and seven percent. Five percent is actually very good. Okay, medications. You know, weight loss medications, we don't have many in Australia, and I will talk about them, but how much weight loss do they get on average? Not much. 
Ten. Louise is very optimistic. <laughs> Actually, I was, I was thinking more like five percent. In between, it's about it's in between. It's about seven. Yeah. Uh, surgery. How much weight loss does bariatric surgery lead to? The surgeons will tell you 60 to 75% excess weight loss. What is that in real, what is it in these terms? Because I lost 75% of excess weight. Okay, 25. Any other takers? So 20. Okay, all right. Lifestyle management, as Louise has talked about this, healthier diets, activity, sleeping. Very low energy diets. Again, I'm, I'm happy to expand on any of these topics and we've, we've got plenty of time. These are basically a meal replacements. Why do, why do very low energy diets work? Yeah, well, or why do people, what, sorry, let me go backwards. What is a very low energy diet? What does that mean? If we said 2000 calories was roughly what a female should be having to maintain a healthy weight in our society, what's a very low energy diet? Roughly how many calories are we talking about? 1,200, I said, was a low calorie diet. So what's a very low calorie diet? Yeah, yeah. So why can't you do that with food rather than with these things? Nutrients. Yep. In, in terms of, in order to have 800 calories, to have all of the spread of nutrients and micronutrients that you need, it's very hard. So why can people stick to this at 800 calories and they can't do that with food? Well, do they stick to it that well? There's no choice. It's very easy and convenient. Well, the companies will tell you that when you're on this, when you're on 800 calories and it's low carbohydrate, you develop ketosis, and the ketosis stops you from getting hungry. Sure, I, I think there's some merit in that, but there's only two patients in my whole career who have said to me after having one shake at, at, during their mealtime, can I have a second one? Mm -hmm. Has anyone ever tasted it? It's the palatability. In other words, if you had a, a vitamin pill that had everything that you needed in it and that you could take, would you want a second one? The answer is no, because it's not palatable. And my dietitian who says, oh yeah, these aren't too bad, I turn around and say, look, when they start selling them at the coffee shop and people are paying for them, that's when I know they'll, they'll be highly palatable. <laughs> 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 now, in terms of more, um, in terms of research, this is probably this is the best lifestyle intervention study that I'm aware of. This is in the United States, and there are some good things about the United States. One good thing is that when they do clinical trials, they they actually achieve more than ninety five percent follow up. And the reason I always say for that is because if you don't stay in the study, you don't get any treatment. So there's a huge incentive. But as you can see here, after the first year in this study. And patients in the look ahead, on average, weighed about 100 kilos. So they, they lost about, um, what they did is they had weekly visits for the first six months uh, with either a dietitian, an exercise physiologist, or, or a counsellor, and they lost about 9%. By about year four, it was down to about 5%. Okay? So that's the 5% figure that you talked about before. Back in 2003, I put together a clinic at Concord Hospital, which I call the metabolic rehabilitation. And again, the notion of rehabilitation was that you could take away whatever comorbidities that you had before. Some people would say I use that word, so I wouldn't use the word obesity, but not really. Um, then in 2009, started one in Camden Hospital. And the important components, as you can see here, are that um, having medical, nursing, dietetics, psychology, mm -hmm. physiotherapy, all in the one spot at the one time, etc. So a, a, a specialist obesity service, as Louise said before, a, a level three tertiary, well, a tertiary uh, obesity service, and it also had on-site supervised exercise classes. At the time when I launched the Concord program, uh, I remember the media saying, "Well, why don't we just let people go to the gym? Why don't we? Any 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 reasons why people think that I should cost? Any others?" People who are really overweight would probably not feel confident going to yeah. the gym. Full of thin people. Yeah. yeah. I, I, mean, I, I mean, about two years ago, I got into a lift with one of my patients at Concord. After her first session at the gym, she was all smiles. And I said, uh, I, I, Deborah, let's say, Deborah I said, Deborah, why are you so happy? She said, it's the first gym I've ever been to that was no lycra. Yeah. Didn't see any lycra at all. Yeah. So they felt safe there. Yeah. So, and, and the people that I see usually have at least six or eight comorbidities, as, as I showed you before, they're, they're at the end stage. So they feel safe physically and psychologically. And also, just some pictures, um, 
these treadmills, a standard gym, a treadmill is probably weight rated to about 160, 180 at the time. These are rated to about 230. People who say that they can't walk, there's other machines here. Or you've got, yeah, where they don't, um, where they can use, they don't have to, there's other type of exercise. So anyone who says I can't exercise, sure, they may not be able to get on the treadmill, but there are activities they can do. In terms of looking at uh, weight outcomes, these the people at uh, Camden on average will probably be about 130 or, or larger. They lost about 11% of their weight at 12 months. I don't, and the people at Concord who are more about 105 kilos, looking at uh, two and a half years, again, about 9%. So about 9% weight loss. So in other words, the more intensive you make the intervention, the more supported you make the intervention, the better results are you going to get, even though, and our patients that we're talking about here are a lot more complicated than the patients that I was showing you in the study in America. <laughs> Louise mentioned this, the Get Healthy, uh, I mean, access, um, it's free, telephone-based coaching, etc. cetera. It, it's, it's useful, especially at a primary care level. In terms of pharmacotherapy, in Australia, um, this has been around for a long time, duramine, fentamine, um, only supposed to be used short term, three months, maximum six months. Uh, Zenical has been around also for a while. That's uh, an, a lipase inhibitor. If you have too much fat, then you're going to get steatorrhea. So patients won't take it. It's a bit like ant abuse for people who have problem drinking. They won't take it. Succenda, an injection of a GLP-1 um, agonist. Um, that's been around now for about two years. Uh, the problem with that is, um, actually, the problem with most obesity management medications is um, they either in the past have been discontinued because they, they don't, uh, they cause structural cardiac abnormalities, or unfortunately, they make people want to kill themselves. <laughs> just, just a small detail. You know, there are many, uh, what I mean by that is where you want the drugs to work the best, centrally acting. Um, I remember when my daughter was born, I had to go off to Florida. There was a selective drug, a D2, D5 antagonist. It was supposed to make highly palatable food taste the same as non-palatable food. So it could make that, um, you know, um, cheese and bacon croissant taste like wheat mix. <laughs> Unfortunately, as I said, the suicide rates were sky high. <laughs> the um, cannabinoid receptor antagonist, uh, Ramonabat, depression, suicide. It didn't even hit the market in Australia. Now, the reason I put tapiramate here, tapiramate is a medication that's used in um, epilepsy, but it has got some effects in terms of um, people's cravings and their desire to have food. Looking at things a little bit, liraglutide, which was Succenda, actually I'll just go back, that's the injectable one. The other problem that it has is, of course, in Australia, no medication in Australia for weight management is on the PBS. That costs three hundred and eighty dollars per month. Yeah, so we'll have we'll see how much it costs per kilo. In, sorry, so that's or just almost five thousand dollars a year, and this is the weight loss. This this is in patients with pre-diabetes. So when your complications are not as severe, the outcomes are usually better. But if you look here, between that's placebo, that's um, liraglutide. There's about a six percent difference, or five, and by the end of um, three years, seven and two, seven, sorry, seven and um, three percent. So about a four percent difference. So it's about a thousand dollars for each percent weight. And as you can see, this is nowhere near. Patients want at least fifteen percent weight loss, at least. Nick, what about that new one you tell us? Tell oh, me. Yeah, jumping the gun. <laughs> All right, in terms of other obesity management medications, in, some, in, in the United States, what I showed you before, um, fentanyl and tapiramate, there's actually a combined medication where they combine it. The difference is that tapiramate is extended release. Well, actually, it's the fentanyl. I should have made that wrong. It's the fentanyl that's extended release and at much lower dose. So you can use it a long time. Again, weight loss about 7%, you know, on average. Um, this is a selective serotonin receptor um, agonist uh, in the US again now for about six years, similar weight loss, and this is what John's referring to. This just gained TGA approval in Australia uh, about a week ago. 
You haven't heard anything about it because there is no product in Australia, so the company's just hanging off. But this is, as you can see here, this is a dopamine and nicotinic receptor antagonist um, in the past used to help people stop smoking. And this is a competitive antagonist uh, opioid receptor antagonist given to people when they have an opioid overdose. So, again, it's talking about, and, and this is actually the, the guy who put this um, together was Michael Corley. Uh, he's from Melbourne, so it's an Australian um, combination. Again, function, hitting not the hunger or satiety area, it's the reward centres, because that's why most people have what they have. It's about reward. And it's only, they only stop having what they're having when they feel uncomfortable. So they keep eating, they're getting this positive uh, influence back, and once they start feeling uncomfortable, that's when they stop. And um, so, but then the concept that I was saying before, some of the new concepts um, looking at pharmacotherapy are, if you look at people, remember this is what patients wanted. They wanted to lose at least 15% of their weight. So if you're on the $5,000 a year medication, what percentage of people, this is with pre-diabetes, um, so averaging out, only about one in 10 people would achieve 15% weight loss or more. For it's a, a lot of money. This is actually exciting in a way. Um, just to go back, in terms of liraglutide, the average weight loss, as I was saying before, uh, at 12 months is about um, <coughs> seven or 8%. As just like with the other medications. What they did was there's a new medication that's been trialled. There's a few of the centres in Australia who are involved in that trial. Again, it's an injection daily. It's another GLP-1 agonist. It's called semaglutide. This only just came out about two weeks ago. And as you can see here, greater than 15% weight loss, greater than 20% weight loss. Um, semaglutide, more than half of the people on this medication have lost more than 15%, and almost half of the people have lost 20% of their weight. So this is getting close to bariatric surgery for, for some. And liraglutide, as we said before, it's only about 2% of people who lose more than 15, 6% in this group. Yes? Do they just take the drug? Does the patient just take the drug and not have to change any of their behaviours? Or Well, then, no, they're advised to. All, all of these things, it's not just, um, yeah, uh, yeah they're, 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 there is advice about what they should be having, yeah. but but the advice, as you can see, is which is uh, placebo in in the okay probably the best. I mean, this is placebo yeah. where they're given the advice, they're just given the dummy drug. Yeah. They still achieved you know three percent weight loss. Yeah. It's only the difference between them. So these drugs are not they're not that great, but for the individual, they might be fantastic, and and this is probably. In terms of average weight loss, semaglutide is about 12%. But if you're one of those people that responds really well, you may want to continue it. I don't know what that's going to cost. That's going to be interesting. If, if the less effective one and weaker one costs $5,000 a year, how much is that going to cost? I don't know. Bariatric surgery. I'm sure a lot of you are probably interested in that. These are the three operations that are mostly done in Australia, unless you live in... Um, Victoria, where they still do lap banding. Everywhere else in the world has gone away from um, laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding. Even though the media, every time they talk about bariatric surgery, that's the first thing they talk about. This is the operation. Probably 70% of the world does that. Um, this is the one that's been around the longest, and this is the new kid on the block. And the, the point, this is from the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, this was their title, Bariatric Surgery versus intensive therapy for diabetes. Vicky was with me when I was working uh, uh, with Leon. He's a, Leon Lax is a sleep physician who said to me, oh, no, no, but it's not versus. And I always thought it was because I forgot to read some of the fine print. And then when I went and looked at it, in the conclusion, bariatric surgery plus intensive. <laughs> and this is the, yeah. the, supposedly the most prominent and prestigious medical journal, and yet they put that in the title. It is not versus. It is... As it suggests, everyone in this stampede trial, and this was one of probably the, the, the first really good randomised control study looking at bariatric surgery, all of these patients had to see all of these people, multiple visits, um, early and continual titration of medications. And as you can see here, change from baseline at five years, 
the people who had a sleeve gastrectomy, 19% weight loss. That's, that's in the category of, uh, for most patients, oh, it's okay. That's why the surgeons like talking about excess weight loss. Mm. If you ever hear a surgeon talking about excess weight loss, just divide it by three. That's the real thing. And, and as you can see here, the bypass led to 23% weight loss. Placebo, or not placebo, just the medical therapy, again, lifestyle, 5%. Okay. But it wasn't surgery or not. Otherwise, I always joke with my patients and say, well, if that was true, we'd have a black van going around, you know, sneaking people into the back of the van, operating, letting them out, and then they'd be fine. It's not like that. And the same thing applies to surgery, as Louise said for her study, looking at whether it be home intervention. The people that do the best are those people that continue to seek treatment and continue to be supported. And Michelle, who's here, is doing a PhD on bariatric surgery. She's actually going to tease out a lot of that data for us. But I can tell you from my looking at it from my patients and others, I definitely believe that those people who continue to engage in treatment are the ones who do best. All right. Looking at this is um, this is a Swiss study. <laughs> this, in this study, what they did is they they compared um, sleeve gastrectomy in the red to a bypass. The good thing about um, the Swiss and the Scandinavian countries as well is they have, um, they have this had about an over 95% follow-up. So you know what the real world is. As you can see here, as um, the average weight loss um, at about five years after their operation is about 25%, as Louise said. And there isn't very much difference between a sleeve and a bypass. This is uh, an op so those two are two randomized control studies um, of medium duration, five years. This is a, a Swedish obese subject study, and that's going to be up to 20 years. Um, the difference is these were not laparoscopic surgeries. These were open surgeries with laparotomies. A gastric bypass, again, about 25% weight loss at about 20 years. But by that stage, the numbers are quite small, around about, but that just gives you an idea. We're talking about 25%. This is uh, another American study, uh, again, with about 500 patients. Um, it's in Utah, close community. So again, they've got well over 95% follow-up. So we know the real figures. And this is with um, rule and white gastric bypasses. Uh, at 12 years, roughly about 30% weight loss. A huge variation. Yes, thank you, Louise. This is the, the, the thing about it, the huge variation. Um, some people actually put on weight after surgery. Yeah. And, and, it's, and they say that one in five people who have bariatric surgery doesn't achieve... See, the surgeons define um, unsuccessful surgery as surgery that leads to less than 15% weight loss. And it's usually roughly about one in five people. The trick is to be able to find which ones. Now, in terms of... I'll talk about real life. In Sydney and South West Sydney, as uh, Louise mentioned before, the bariatric surgery program was started in 2009, and this is what Michelle's reviewing. Um, and as you can see here, the patients that we're talking about are much heavier than the studies that I've talked about before. The previous studies were about uh, between 100 and 120. The average person here is about 140, has a lot more comorbidities, uh, more, because in, in research studies, they exclude everyone who's difficult. These are the real life, and, and we achieved about a 25% or 27% weight loss um, as well. So this is real life. The point I want to make about this is the, there are differences between the uh, exercise, what, what I do at Concord and Camden, and compared to Royal Prince Alfred. But the thing that I wanted to highlight is in any weight management program, as you can see here, it's usually um, three quarters of females who participate in any intervention. And it's only about a quarter men. Whereas if you have an exercise group, that's how you engage men. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the programs that I have, it's about a 50-50 split, 50-50 men and women. Whereas in practically everything else you will see. And in the drug trial that I showed you before with the new drug semaglutide, they deliberately limited. They said, we will not allow more than 70% women into the study. <laughs> that's the first time I've ever seen that. And I thought, yeah, fair enough, it's interesting. And in terms of, if I ask my patients when I see them, because not, if you look at the Australian community, and there are probably one and a half million people in Australia who are eligible to have bariatric surgery, um, but I can tell you, most of those one and a half million people don't want to have bariatric surgery. 
if the vast majority don't want to have surgery. But if you ask them, and I'll say to patients when they come in, there's essentially three groups. There's those who definitely want to have it, those who are not sure, and those who definitely don't want to. And if I say to them, why don't you want to have surgery? I just want to understand how they're thinking. A lot of people will say, well, I know four people have had surgery, two people did really well, and two people did really poorly. Or we go out to dinner with them or we're at their house, they'll have their food, and then 15, 20 minutes later, they're off to the bathroom. What that means is they're vomiting. That's what they're trying to say. So the Australian government, in terms of working out what's true, um, what are the true figures, and also for a safety, put together the bariatric surgery registry. And the last report was in June of last year. Um, again, as you can see, 99% of surgery is done in the private sector. As you can see here, three quarters of females who have it done. Um, in terms of the uh, weight loss results, 20% 20, 20 weight loss. I was the one who jumped up and down and made, made sure that they uh, presented their figures in percentage weight loss. Because they only, they only had... Physicians rule. Well, I just I thought, you're using a language that's... And the reason for that is why it's not 25%, as Louise said, is because a lot of these patients also had adjustable laparoscopic gastric bands. They don't have anywhere near the same follow-up as in the studies or in the... Uh, specialist obesity services. So roughly um, lap laparoscopic bands achieve between 15 and 20% weight loss and then the other operations are between say 20 and 30% and that's an average. But as you can see here, the average person who has bariatric surgery in Australia doesn't achieve anywhere, only achieves half the weight loss they want. So when I see people and do a group education session, I'll say to them, they say, I want to lose 70 or 80 kilos and I say to them, well, you have to be at the top of the class. If you're not at the top of the class, you're not going to achieve that. You need to understand that. Now, um, this is what I tell people about bariatric surgery when I'm doing it. I tell them to expect to lose about 20%. You might say I'm being a little bit pessimistic, but yeah. Um, that they'll, they'll need to be, eat slowly and smaller meals and they will feel full earlier. If they don't eat slowly, they're going to have the pinball effect. What goes down comes up very quickly. And that's when they vomit. Most people who come along after surgery vomiting, I'll ask them and say, why? They say, oh, we forgot we'd had the surgery. We just ate at the same speed and we ended up vomiting. They need to be aware of protein intake. It's actually difficult in the early phases of bariatric surgery to have an adequate protein level. Um, and, they need, and because of that, they need to avoid liquid calories because liquid calories... Bariatric surgery is a little bit like speed humps. When it rains, all the rain goes, sure, the solid cars slow down, but all the liquid still goes straight through. So people who um, fail bariatric surgery, if you're able to take a dietary history and they're comfortable enough to tell you, invariably what they do is they'll blend food, they'll make it soft, so it'll go through. Even though a lot of people, call it, my colleagues in the international scene will say, oh, it doesn't really slow down food, etc. If you have the... the appropriate amount of food, that's true. But if we all try to rush through this narrow opening, I can tell you it slows down. I've got here the ability to move or exercise more if you wish. Most of the people that I see will say, after I've had the surgery, I'll be able to do all this exercise, etc." And this is um, Dale Bond, who's a psychiatrist in the US, um, did this great research study where he looked at questionnaires, um, people filled them in, and they were all exercising 50% more after surgery. The good thing is at the same time you put accelerometers on them. And I can tell you they were not moving at all. It was no different. Absolutely. So what people think they do, whether it be from eating or activity, is very different to what you actually measure. And that's why I say to them, you can move or exercise more if you wish. Whether you do or not is a different question. They need to take daily multivitamins, whether it's a bypass operation or a, or a, a sleeve operation, you still get deficiencies in vitamin D, iron, B12, and even um, copper as well. I also tell people when we're doing the, the seminars what you may not want to expect after surgery because everyone who wants to have surgery is focusing on all the good stuff. And I tell them, in many cases, you'll actually have difficulty in drinking for, on average for four weeks. For many people, it's actually more than that. Some people can't have solids <laughs> for um, six months or even longer. Um, you may get regurgitation of food or vomiting. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, vomiting as well. A lot of people don't want to have bariatric surgery because they don't want to go out with their friends and their friends are ordering main meal sizes and they can't finish them. 
And so a lot of people who have bariatric surgery um, will actually take a lot of food home. And, and some people, you may find it interesting, I didn't know this until recently, they actually have little cards where they'll go to a restaurant and the restaurant will say, I'm not serving you a kid's meal. And then they'll give it to them so they can be discreet where they say, I've had bariatric surgery, I'm not able to. And then they say, okay, fair enough. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that until recently. And just on Friday, I was telling um, John that one of my patients said they're going on a cruise, has had bariatric surgery, has gone from, I'm uh, not just bariatric surgery, but as part of our program, has gone from 140 kilos and is now 80 kilograms. So that's better than average. But the insurance company, the cruise is costing seven, $800. The insurance company wants to charge them five hundred dollars for medical insurance, and I, and and that's that's discrimination. That's a stigma. I said, well, four, you're going to eat less anyway. They should be charging you less, not more. But um, and in terms of not being able to eat sweet foods or sweet drinks, people's taste can change. Or having food that goes faster into the um, duodenum or the foregut can cause uh, symptoms such as dumping syndrome, etc. And I've had people come in who knew that they needed to have surgery. And, and our philosophy, the way what we do in the programs that I'm involved in, we help people to lose as much weight as they can. And it's when their weight plateaus, that's when we have the discussion about bariatric surgery. Because one in 20 people will be able to lose the amount of weight that they want to. It's only at that point when they're plateaued and we feel that they can maintain that long term, are there any further benefits in losing weight? Are there any benefits, as Louise said, in, um, well, there are, the difficulty for most people is maintaining that significant weight loss. That's when we have the discussion. But some people who make a decision about surgery, then after come back, and I had one gentleman who was almost in mourning. He couldn't have sweets anymore, even though he's diabetes. He knew he shouldn't, but because he couldn't, it was, it was a grieving reaction, which was very interesting. An increased enjoyment out of alcohol. If you have bariatric surgery, one thing is it may only take you one drink to get over the limit and be above 0.05. Wow. The absorption is very quick. <laughs> now, in terms of it's only a small percentage of people. There are people who I know who are drinking excessively before surgery who after surgery say, I can't drink as much. But then there are also other people whose enjoyment out of alcohol goes up quite a lot um, and they develop a problem with it. It's not a huge amount, but it, people need to be aware of this. Now, in rat studies, this is the interesting thing. Uh, rats do not like alcohol. But if you do a gastric bypass on a rat, guess what? It loves it. <laughs> not, yeah, so, but that doesn't... Yeah, we don't know why, but there, there's all these... But they, people need to be aware. Everyone gets hair loss and brittle nails, despite even taking vitamins. If they don't, then they haven't lost enough weight. And they're usually up... At about the 12-month mark, it all settles down. Not, not the amount as in someone who would have chemotherapy, but they do get it. And also excess skin. For many people, this is, I'll, I'll talk about that later, but this is a typical after surgery, usually in the first week or two, they're just on fluids. Then they might go to a puree diet. That is if they can tolerate it. Then they might go to a soft diet and then a solid diet, as I was saying. And people who don't... Oh, no, just five, five minutes, yeah. sorry. <laughs> okay. Yes. And people who don't adhere to it might get a, I, I spoke about that briefly, excess skin. Some people say that the excess skin is actually worse than having their obesity. So in, in many cases, unless you understand that in the first place, um, you may not want to offer surgery to someone, or at least that needs to be factored into their treatment. <laughs> now, I want to talk, these are some of the last, balloons have been around for a long time endoscopically, but they need to be taken out after six months. They lead to about 10% weight loss. When they come out, people go back to what they were doing before. I want to talk about this just very quickly. This is what's called laparoscopic gastric plication. It's basically laparoscopic. What they do is basically fold the stomach in upon itself and then sew it up so you get a much narrower, much narrower aperture and it fills a lot quicker. This hasn't taken off. The reason it started um, about 10 years ago is because it's actually cheaper than doing bariatric surgery. And the reason for that is because you don't have staples. So the staples usually cost about $2,000. Um, so the, this was an Iranian study. This is the longest one that I saw. The problem is that after four years, the suture that's used, you know, this shows that it's only one suture, actually breaks down and then it's extruded. And the stomach sort of goes back to what it was. 
um, they do lose 20% of their weight initially, but then after it goes back. The reason I mentioned this, as I said, from a surgical perspective, it hasn't taken off, but recently the big thing that's um, in Sydney is people are talking about endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. In other words, they're talking about endoscopic sleeves rather than what I was telling you about before with the sleeve gastrectomy. So essentially what they do is they go into the stomach with an endoscope and you can sew it from the inside. Now, this isn't going to have any better results than the placation that I showed you, but people perceive it as a safer operation. And, yeah, I, I just think these things are experimental. That's experimental. That's experimental. And it should be thought of that way. And as I was showing you before, in terms of the operation, and I'll finish practically there. So as you can see, there are the staple lines. That's a sleeve. Essentially what you do is you cut out 80% of the stomach and you're left with the sleeve. So you've got a pouch and then you're just left with the sleeve. I think that might be... Yep. There we go. Perfect. Perfect.